go right into the introductory video for Eric Hoyt. And that goes right into Eric's presentation. And I will meet Eric at the other end here. So what, I, what I'll go do here, I'll shortly, I am uh, muting myself and I'll disappear from screen. Okay, Tony, who is actually behind the screens, like a, like the Wizard of Oz here behind the black screen. So Tony, I'll let you take it away here. I'm muting and, um, and I'll take my video off. The American Cetacean Society is excited to introduce Eric Hoyt's talk on allocating ocean spaces. Marine protected areas for whales are not enough. Eric Hoyt is a research fellow with the Whale and Dolphin Conservation, WDC, and founder slash co-director of the long-term Far East Russia Orca Project, FIROP, in Kamchatka and Commander Islands. His 25 books, translated variously into 16 languages, include marine protected areas for whales, dolphins and porpoises, and orca, the whale called killer, published in 2019 in an expanded fifth edition. He has written three books about deep sea creatures for adults and children, including his latest, Strange Sea Creatures, November 2020. An invited member of the IUCN Cetacean Specialist Group and the World Commission on Protected Areas. He co-chairs the IUCN Marine Mammal Protected Areas Task Force, which is currently rolling out a tool for marine mammal habitat conservation called the Important Marine Mammal Area, or EMA. He has received a number of awards and honors, including the Mandy McMath Conservation Award for his body of work from the European Cetacean Society. He lives with his family in Dorset, England. Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Hoyt. I'm happy to be here. I'm in England uh, on the uh, West Dorset, the, the Jurassic Coast. And um, I'd rather be with you. I'd rather be with all of us together. Still, we should give a huge thanks to UCO and the American Cetacean Society and others who have made this possible. Now I'll just share my screen. So I'm gonna talk about allocating ocean spaces. Marine protected areas for whales are not enough. Over lockdown, I've been reading about Arthur Conan Doyle, the Sherlock Holmes author, and his experiences as a young doctor in 1880, working on an Arctic trawler and joining in with whaling and sealing crews, uh, witnessing the harpooning of a bowhead whale. And these are some of the pages from his diary, which he illustrated. Um, he was a pretty good cartoonist. Sir, Sir Arthur uh, lamented the disappearance of bowheads, right whales, and the decline of other whale species, saying that the surviving whales had, quote, deserted the open sea and bored deeper and deeper among the ice barriers until now at last, and he means by the 1880s, whales really appear to have reached inaccessible feeding grounds, keeping far in among the ice fields to shake off the most intrepid of pursuers. And reading this reminded me of Scott Krause's account um, in August 1980 of flying over the Bay of Fundy and rediscovering North Atlantic right whales, 16 of them, including eight mother calf pairs, indicating that they had not gone extinct. And there was this idea that the right whales perhaps had escaped the notice of whalers um, by hiding in uh, the very treacherous tidal conditions of the Bay of Fundy. Uh, of course, the Bay of Fundy is littered with uh, shipwrecks. And there are other similar accounts of um, whales cleverly hiding or retreating to escape the harpoons. Um, and recently, uh, Giuseppe Nota Bartolo de Chiara told me about the case of the sperm whale in the Ligurian Sea uh, in the Mediterranean where drift nets drove them away. Uh, and since the drift nets have been removed from the Pelagos Sanctuary, the sperm whales are back, which may or may not be an, uh, an indication of this. And I invite you to consider, however, another interpretation that these areas, which were missed by the whalers, were simply the preferred habitats 
of the portion of the population that survived. There's no evidence that these whales had moved into these secret areas to avoid whalers, but there's a lot of evidence that whales return to the same areas year after year to feed, breed, raise their calves. Site fidelity, we call it. And how do we know this? Uh, from photo ID um, of individual whales, which began in um, the early 1970s. The whalers knew, uh, already knew that the whales were returning to some of the same places, but photo ID confirmed that, and among other things, taught us that the same individual whales often return to the same places. Indeed, those exact same Bay of Fundy right whales that Scott Krauss saw on that uh, first day were spending their winters, uh, they he later learned, in the warm, shallow waters off northern Florida and Georgia. And with some populations where we have thousands of photo IDs, as well as recordings and genetic materials, such as for humpback whales in the North Pacific, we realize that there are whales that go to some unknown place. Again, they're not hiding out. It's simply one of their habitats, which they will soon uncover. The fact, this fact is what gives the concept of marine protected areas some currency when it comes to protecting whale and other marine mammal habitats. For as much as whales may migrate and range over wide areas, they return to certain core habitats, and that's what we can protect. Now, that doesn't mean they'll always return. If water temperatures change and the food moves, the whales will move. But we have evidence, for example, at Stellwagen Bank and around Glacier Bay and other areas where humpbacks change their feeding grounds for a few seasons, that once the food returned, they also returned to their former preferred habitats. We also have the case of the right whales moving into the Gulf of St. Lawrence in recent years, likely a former habitat. And Alex Morton this month reported that the Northern resident orca pod A5 with the big bull Fife and a new calf had returned to um, Fife Sound, abandoned 25 years earlier after a salmon farm began using acoustic harassment devices to repel seals. And that salmon farm is finally gone, but the memory of the favored place remained in these long-lived orcas. So my hypothesis here can be shaped into the following statement. Whales and other marine mammals have a strong sense of place. <clears throat> I learned about this sense of place firsthand <clears throat> in the early 1970s, spending parts of 10 summers with killer whales off northeastern Vancouver Island. The, the pioneer of orca photo ID, Mike Big, was starting his work then, and we were lucky to be able to uh, to learn from him. And there was uh, this untouched bay, uh, Robson Bight, uh, unlogged at the mouth of the unlogged uh, Virgin Sitka River Valley, the last untouched uh, valley on eastern Vancouver Island, where the whales would play, rest, and rub on smooth pebbles and on the bottom, a cultural activity. And after we'd been coming back every summer for six or seven years to spend time with the whales, Mac Blow, Macmillan Blowdell Limited, then Canada's largest logging company, announced that they were going to log the Sitka Valley and boom the logs in Robson Bight. And we talked to um, the logging company, there, I mean, there was no research published at the time on killer whales and their use of Robson Bite. But when I asked um, Mike Big and John Ford, who had just uh, started his work, to help quantify the whale's use of the bite, um, they produced um, very valuable statements that we were able to use um, in uh, campaigning for this area. Um, when I talked to the um, chief forester at Macmillan Blodell Limited, Grant Ainscoff, he gave me the statement that, um, oh, there was no problem. This is the way we do business everywhere in terms of having, uh, booming the logs um, out, you know, uh, shipping them down the rivers and booming them in the uh, estuaries. And besides, the whales will probably just rub on the logs. 
So it was important. It was really an important moment for those of us who had spent most of a decade with these orcas. So we really fought for a protected area. And after a couple of years, um, we got a very small area. You can see the magnifying glass. Um, it's a few square kilometers, um, a postage stamp area, although it has had importance in terms of marking the area. Um, <clears throat> so I started thinking about this idea of whales needing habitat and a healthy ocean and what that all means and doing a lot of reading and thinking about whether marine protected areas could be part of the answer. And these are, of course, all the elements of a healthy ocean, which you see here. And looking up the definition of a marine protected area, um, which uh, has been um, sort of shaped over the years, uh, this is the most recent one, uh, definition of a protected area, clearly defined geographical space, recognized, dedicated, and managed, uh, through legal or other effective means to achieve the long-term conservation of nature with associated ecosystem services and cultural values. And of course, a marine protected area is, a, is just a protected area in the ocean. Uh, we also use the term MMPA or marine mammal protected area sometimes. Now there are hundreds of names for MPAs. Um, the, it's really just a generic term. Um, Highly protected MPAs are often called marine reserves, although that's not an absolute as well. And uh, many MPAs benefit from uh, biosphere architecture, which um, has highly protected areas in the interior zones surrounded by transition areas and buffer zones. MPAs are just one tool. Um, there are other tools that can be used for conservation. Uh, IMO directives for shipping, you know, bans on whaling, UN General Assembly directives to stop drift and bottom net, bottom trawling have been uh, uh, modestly successful uh, in terms of reducing the amount, especially of drift net fishing. <clears throat> but one of the things that's been very helpful with IUCN is um, categorizing the different levels of protection. Um, from category one to six. So if you have an MPA, um, a lot of um, practitioners use um, these categories to illustrate how protected it is. And in fact, one protected area often has multiple categories. Um, so in this diagram at the right, you can see the red areas would be highly protected, category 1A or 1B. And um, then some of the surrounding areas would be more like category four or five, and then uh, buffer zones. Um, the uh, Great Barrier Reef, for example, has multiple different categories uh, and tools used that are part of the overall marine protection. So learning all this about MPAs, um, and as they began to grow in number, uh, in the 1990s. They were, of course, way behind protected areas on land. I began to realize that um, this thinking about the need for habitat protection was not happening at all in the wider whale, dolphin, and marine mammal world. Uh, and the MPA people were not thinking about whales and marine mammals and how they might be useful and how they might even be protected. There was this idea that they were just out there swimming around and and how could you protect them anyway? You know, you, you'd, you'd need huge, absolutely massive areas. Of course, there was the bias on land from much smaller areas in the ocean. Uh, it wasn't recognized yet that you, except with Great Barrier Reef, that you needed a large area uh, if you're going to protect uh, ocean systems. So I wrote this book, Marine Protected Areas for Whales, Dolphins, and Porpoises, in two editions to try and put these two groups together and uh, get them talking. So how useful are whales for ocean conservation? Well, of course, humans identify with charismatic marine mammals. Uh, whales are um, umbrella species. They bring, on, bring in a lot of other species in terms of protection, uh, if you protect uh, a whale area. Uh, whales are good indicators of the health of the sea. All the marine mammals are tethered to the surface by their need to breathe air 
And so they become really good ways of, um, of um, finding out what's going on in that piece of ocean. And of course, whales fertilize and support life on the ocean floor. And at the same time, how you know, we ask how useful are MPAs for whale conservation. Well, whale MPAs serve as platforms for stakeholder engagement in ocean issues and for ecosystem management. So even if you have a small area like Robson Bight, you do get uh, a lot of traction in terms of um, killer whale protection just by having that um, uh, land area. Uh, the, or sorry, that uh, marine area protected. And the best MPAs, of course, focus on protecting um, core habitats, zoning, and linking everything up in uh, networks. And that's what this diagram is trying to show you with the hump, humpback whales on uh, feeding grounds as well as on breeding grounds and how that might be linked up even across countries um, by networks of MPAs. And really this brings out the fact that um, not only whales, but humans uh, have a strong sense of place. And it's something we, we share with whales. In fact, we see this in many animals, um, perhaps most clearly in the mammals with defended territories. But somehow I think it surprised a lot of people to see this in the ocean too. So what are the steps to maintain healthy seas for whales? Well, we have to locate their habitats um, multi-year cetacean research, photo ID, acoustics, transect studies, all of this. Evaluate the threats, establish good baselines and monitoring, give stakeholders a stake. Again, work with researchers, stakeholders, and others to devise an ecosystem management plan and look at legal structures to devise management plans and set up management bodies that work. A lot of MPAs stop at this last uh, process of getting the management bodies and the, the management plans together. Um, also, a lot of uh, countries uh, until recently didn't have uh, legal structures. I remember when I first moved to the UK um, and meeting with other conservationists in Scotland to talk about the fact that the UK had 76 different pieces of legislation that related to protecting uh, uh, pieces of, of um, marine marine water or uh, marine the marine and uh, in fact there was only one marine protected area at that time a really tiny place around Lundy Island and it took about five or six years um, or m most of a decade in fact to put in place legislation that could effectively um, protect uh, marine protected areas in, um, in and around the UK. And over the last five, 10 years now, finally that's coming on stream. <clears throat> Globally, where do we stand with MPAs? And this is all MPAs, um, not just those with whales and dolphins, 17,000 of them. So 7.6% uh, of the surface area of the ocean is protected and um, only about 5.7% in actively managed MPAs and 2.6% in highly protected areas. Um, but the shocking, most shocking part, I think, is that only 1.2% of the ocean, of the high seas, which is most of the ocean, is protected. Uh, so we have a UN target of 10% of the ocean to be protected by 2020, which we haven't quite made. And... Um, at the World Parks Congress a few years ago in Sydney, we discussed uh, the fact that we should try and get 30% uh, protected um, by 2030. And now the UK has uh, shown a lot of leadership in terms of getting other countries interested in this idea. And to date, 31 countries have subscribed to the 30 by 2030 uh, plan. Now, Edgar et al. in 2014 <clears throat> have um, uh, looked at five key features for successful MPAs. And by successful, they mean ones that uh, where the total fish biomass um, has increased and uh, the number of large fish and the number of uh, sharks and the number of uh, fish species, large fish species. Uh, and these were the things that they found were common to those areas. 
<clears throat> now, if we look at Robson Bite, excuse me, uh, it has one of these things. It's older than 10 years, but not really anything else. If we look at the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, it has most of them. And uh, well enforced, it's, it's a fairly remote area, so it's not so much of an issue, but it's a highly protected area uh, that uh, Bush, the, the, the second Bush and um, Obama created as part of their um, legacy. We could look at the uh, first world's first marine protected area. I think it's an interesting case of the fact that all marine protected areas start out on paper and uh, it's up to uh, local people as to what they become. Um, the Scammons Lagoon was protected for the gray whales in 1972 and uh, the fishermen became very interested in this area in terms of the whale watching and kicked out the American boats um, and uh, Laguna San Ignacio also became part of the reserve uh, along with land areas. So it became a really integrated biosphere reserve uh, type area. Um, but in 1994, the Mitsubishi company uh, wanted to build the world's largest salt works in the lagoon, 116 square kilometers um, in, that's in San Ignacio, including a pier which would stretch for a mile into the Bay of Wales, which would block the gray whale path right into the uh, lagoon. And uh, the local whale watching skippers and fishermen were up in arms and they um, uh, drew the interest of uh, a group of artists and writers and, um, and conservationists in Mexico called the Grupo de la Cien, the group of a hundred. And um, that attracted international interest through various NGOs. And eventually Mitsubishi agreed to give up on its plan. And uh, you know, at that point you can say Elvis, Elvis Cayeno became a real MPA. So these five uh, key features of successful MPAs, um, to some degree, El Vizcaino has five of them, but it also has a very key one, which isn't included in this list and possibly should be a strong engaged community of stakeholders. So looking at um, uh, MPAs for whales and other marine mammals, um, 600, out of the 17,000 have substantial marine mammal content. Um, the red areas on the map are the existing MPAs and the blue are the proposed. And the tan areas are a uh, convention on biological diversity, ecologically or biologically significant areas um, that have been identified. These aren't MPAs, but they're areas of, of importance that may one day become MPAs. Um, but I think the point here, when I started to see what this looked like on a global scale, um, and most of the MPAs are just these little red dots you can hardly see on the map. Um, the fact is that these were um, really ad hoc um, or incidental um, protection areas uh, for the most part. There was a lot of political and socioeconomic bias in the design. These were not true whale habitats or marine habitats. They might have started off that way, but then they got shaped um, by political and uh, socioeconomic factors. And um, uh, they really were areas that are along the coasts and around islands. And the great high seas was not touched at all. So it was really kind of a failure of of what was happening and it wasn't covering most species. You know, not, you know, hardly any of the beaked whales were included. So we began to realize that these MPAs are not gonna be enough. And uh, why do we need to care about this? Well, why not just go along uh, with one MPA at a time and try to do the best we can one by one? Because at the same time, we're thinking like this, the ocean, is in the process of being carved up in pieces for hydrocarbon exploration of gas and oil, fishing, minerals in the seabed. The ocean's a motorway for world shipping. Um, we, we still don't have the regime for managing most of the ocean, the high seas, although we're hoping it's coming in the next couple of years. 
There's a climate emergency and an extinction crisis. We have these overarching reasons that have come to light for keeping whales in the ocean healthy. The fact that uh, one whale, according to uh, uh, Shammy's, um, Ralph Shammy's work recently, uh, is worth $2 million U.S. dollars in tourism, ecosystem benefits, and carbon capture. And most of that's carbon capture. So if the whale populations were able to return to original sizes, this would uh, uh, give a huge additional contribution to addressing climate change. So in view of these concerns, in 2013, a group of us uh, coming out of the International Committee on Marine Mammal Protected Areas, which had been formed a, a few years ago in Hawaii, and was uh, giving conf um, offering conferences to try and bring the marine mammal people and the MPA people together, the managers. Um, we decided we wanted a, a bit more traction and um, we wanted to set up an IUCN task force to identify marine mammal habitats and create global marine mammal layers, fairly ambitious um, at the start and um, had no idea whether we'd be able to raise the money and and uh, develop the interest to be able to do this, but we thought we'd, we would give it a go and um, focus on these 130 species of marine mammals. So we put together a group. This is how it's grown to the present day and had a number of objectives, but really wanted to focus on this last one of enhancing capacity with new conservation tools. And that conservation tool was something we got very interested when we looked at how BirdLife International had used the um, important bird area, which became important bird and biodiversity area, the IBA, to uh, leverage um, a lot of conservation, you know, throughout the um, European Union with the Habitats Directive and the special areas of conservation and worldwide uh, with MPAs. And uh, we said to ourselves, why can't we do this with, um, uh, with um, marine mammals? And we'll create something called the important marine mammal area. So we put together um, a set of criteria with, um, some international meetings with a lot of these experts at the um, uh, IMPACT 3 conference in uh, Marseille. And we um, um, consulted with more than a thousand experts um, over a several year period to refine these uh, criteria and came up with this definition of an IMA, discrete portion of habitat important for one or more marine mammal species that has the potential to be delineated and managed for conservation. Now, IMAs are not marine protected areas. They're not identified on the basis of management considerations. They're evidence driven and purely biocentric, not political, not socioeconomic. Um, they're based on the application of scientific criteria on the best available science. And we have a three-stage process. We tried to put together a robust, robust process for identifying these areas that started with uh, anyone being able to nominate a preliminary area of interest to fill out a form. And we collated all these preliminary areas of interest in um, a given region. And then it would go to a scientific workshop of between 20 and 50 people um, to um, uh, go through the, the, the um, proposed areas, the, the areas of interest, and to look at um, which ones could had strong enough case uh, in terms of the data that's available to make into a candidate IMA. And then those areas went to uh, peer review, independent peer review in stage three, and uh, had to um, be accepted by an expert panel. And, and um, in fact, um, somewhere between 75 and 80%, uh, sometimes a little bit lower than that, were accepted. There was a lot of back and forth between the original points of contact for each candidate, Emma, and uh, the um, reviewer. 
and uh, uh, then then those areas would eventually go on what we what we call the E atlas, which I'll show you in a minute. So this is pre-workshop, the kind of uh, when you have preliminary areas of interest. This is what the map might look like in the Northeast Indian Ocean, Southeast Asian seas, and then after the workshop uh, starts to look like that. Um, with the candidate MS, and then uh, after review, um, and the boundaries are all uh, shaped very carefully, um, that's the way um, it would end up. So we've dealt with um, six now of the 17 IMA regions, approximately one third of the surface of the ocean. Um, and it takes about a year uh, to do one of these regions um, there's some overlap from one to the other um, as we've been able to increase capacity in terms of the number of people working on this. Um, the the uh, next area we're going to do in February will be an online workshop in the Black, for the Black and Caspian Sea with experts there. And then we're hoping later in the year to uh, work on the uh, Southeast Temperate and Tropical Pacific Ocean. Uh, the west coast of Latin America, and hoping that we'll be uh, able to be in person, uh, but it may be a combination of online and in person, or, you know, even under the best uh, uh, possibilities. We just don't know yet. So far, we have 159 IMAs identified and put onto the E Atlas. This just shows you the projection with, the, with Antarctica. Um, there's our website where you can find all this, marinemammalhabitat.org. When you click on a given area, you get a, a summary, and then you get more detailed um, explanation and a PDF that can be downloaded. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, the largest area to date, 2.8 million square kilometers, the Prince Edward Islands and Western Oceanic Waters, IMA, for fur seals, southern elephant seals, and killer whales, the smallest, Akrotiri, IMA, for Mediterranean monk seals. The total area of all the 159 IMAs is 15.6 million square kilometers. And about half of them are less than 10,000 kilometers in size, and only 13% are larger than 100,000 uh, square kilometers. We have an IMA searchable database um, where you can find information on the 159 areas. And of course, um, spatial um, layers can be downloaded. Um, there's an agreement that needs to be signed, but they're, they're offered, of course, for free. And uh, we've had more than 100 requests for them, sometimes uh, scientists, uh, business, um, different agencies, conservation, NGOs, uh, a wide range of groups, the U.S. Navy, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, now, what's good about ANIMA? I mean, there's no good unless they're, they have limited value unless they're being used for conservation purposes. So we're now starting to see take up by the Convention on Biological Diversity, and they're um, hopefully starting to be used in marine spatial planning. Uh, we have some examples in the creation of MPAs um, and other, other tools here. Uh, one of the useful things was the Convention on Migratory Species uh, put together a resolution um, that uh, we submitted they agreed a resolution acknowledging our criteria and the process and requesting uh, the parties to identify specific areas where IMAs could be beneficial. And that kind of um, um, help has you know, been really uh, fantastic for, uh, from different uh, international groups. The International Whaling Commission the same way have adopted IMAs to identify ship strike issues and uh, we'll work with uh, the International Maritime Organization to help in identifying speed and lane restrictions. I think last October we found that the U.S. Navy was using IMAs. Um, there was uh, about two or three hundred pages in the congressional record that was in, was uh, listing all the IMAs 
um, where they would avoid testing low frequency sonar because of the presence of certain species of whales. Um, key biodiversity areas through the IUCN are being identified through the IMA workshop. And again, MPAs and marine spatial planning um, is there is some take up that is starting to happen now. This just gives you an ex example of the IMAs lying on the paths of global shipping routes. Um, and these sorts of overlay maps, I think, are going to be very useful for pinpointing places that need conservation attention because of ship strikes. Um, this uh, diamond-shaped blue area is the Pelagos Sanctuary for Med Mediterranean Marine Mammals. It was um, set up around the year 2000. And uh, I think if we knew um, the, uh, where the IMA would be for this, for fin whales and sperm whales and various dolphins, which is um, partly in the Pelagos Sanctuary, but also to the west, the shape of that sanctuary may well have been different. I mean, the sanctuary getting approval for it as a, um, a transboundary area um, by Italy, France, and Monaco, and partly on the high seas was a feat in itself. And I think it is, it is useful still to have these images after the fact, because now um, there's the um, management plan and the uh, um, management body for the Pelago Sanctuary is interested in this area, of course, west of the sanctuary. Whether it will get expanded or not, it's still, they will have a concern about the same species of whales that are within the Pelago Sanctuary getting hit by ships and um, and there are also moves through the CMS um, agreement called ACABAMS to um, uh, create measures to help alleviate that um, those ship strikes. I wanted to show this uh, uh, example very quickly of creating a, a traffic route through an MPA. This is not an IMA, but it's a, a marine protected area called the Stellwag and Bank National Marine Sanctuary. And there's really some clever work by Dave, Dave Wiley, uh, Leela Hatch, and others um, associated with uh, Stellwagen to look at um, decades of whale watching research and the baleen whale density um, that they could get from all those sightings. And then to look at, well, which, what kind of routing would you, how would you change that routing? Um, I think the, the existing routing then was the uh, dotted line and the new routing is the sharp um, uh, full, um, full line, dark, uh, dark black line. And uh, that would create less risk in terms of hitting whales um, if the, if the uh, IMO and the, um, could create that traffic route. And of course they did do it. And it means that ships have to spend an extra seven minutes of travel. But um, this is uh, a great example of how we might uh, make changes based on the, the information that we have um, to uh, reduce the risk of ship strikes. And it comes down to uh, you know, showing the value of whales and marine protected areas to society and politicians. And I think we're in a great situation now with um, uh, post COVID, you know, we're almost, po we're not post COVID yet, but we're getting toward that. And I think people realize that um, uh, the climate emergency, the biodiversity uh, crisis um, are things that we're finally, um, we've got, the powers of be, you know, coming coming around to understanding that we have got to do something, and I think that um, showing the costs and the benefits. I mean, there are costs to conservation. We all know that, um, but the benefits are becoming um, stronger and stronger. And I think that's uh, um, the kind of case that we need to build um, in order to to get the kind of changes that we want. And we're lucky to have uh, charismatic whales um, to help to tell these stories. And I think I just wanted to throw a picture of Iceberg, a charismatic killer whale from Russia um, on this image. 
So where do we go from here? Uh, we're hoping for full IMA coverage of the global ocean um, and 30% ocean protection in MPAs by 2030. IMAs give, I mean, hopefully before that, but um, that could be an outside goal. And IMAs give international scientific recognition, but local or national protection efforts, of course, shouldn't wait for IMA identification. Um, United Nations uh, biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction process um, and closing the data gaps in the high seas, that's uh, um, happening now. Well, the, the process is happening. The next step is to close these data gaps in the high seas using satellite images, eDNA, acoustics, plus modeling. And th that really should be a focus over the next 10 years with the UN um, decade of um, ocean research um, that just started January 1st. Um, I think we, um, all of us in the whale field um, and marine mammal field play a role in terms of trying to uh, encourage that to happen. We had a, um, a session at the Marine Mammal Conference, the, Bian the World Marine Mammal Conference in Barcelona last year on this. Um, and there's some traction, it's starting. So IMAs and MPAs with baseline and regular monitoring can be used to check against threats to cetaceans, including ship strike, bycatch, water quality, climate change. So we're, um, our task force is now in the early stages of working on an IMA monitoring program, which we're hoping to put into place to help this. So this is um, my last slide. I want to, I always like to show this um, image from Bering Island uh, in the Commander Island State Biosphere Reserve. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's protected for 30 nautical miles around the two main um, Commander Islands. Um, and on any given day, you can look out and if there's no fog and uh, it's not too rough, you can see whales, you know, humpbacks and baird beaked whales very close to shore and, and killer whales. And um, uh, I think it's, um, we need more areas like this, highly protected MPAs that are just for the whales and other species if we're going to learn how the ocean once was and how we're going to try to uh, keep pieces of it together like that. So thank you very much, and I'm uh, happy to answer questions. Right, wonderful. Uh, we'll make sure that Eric will get you on here shortly. Rick or Tony, you can help. Just a second, look at my, adjust my view while I do that. Ah, wonderful, there we are. Just a second here, good. Um, it's great to see you again, Eric. I just uh, wish we were under different circumstances, but thank you so much for, for being here, for doing this. So I'll uh, make sure that you're, uh, let me show you. Is your audio on here? Just, uh, let's see. Great. Okay, yeah. perfect. You're on. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I, it's a lot of questions coming in for you. Uh, we have, uh, we, we started a little bit early, so we actually have plenty of time, although, um, and I have to say, let me just address one one thing because I keep hearing, of course, got a lot of questions today about uh, whether we record these sessions. We are indeed recording this session. They will obviously have to be cleaned up. We make sure that things are copyrighted correctly. That'll take some time. We'll post those videos, those sessions uh, afterwards at a later date. So we'll stay tuned for that. So let's get that question out of the way. Um, again, Eric, th thanks so much. It's really good to see you. So. Let me just kind of feel some of the questions that we have here. Uh, obviously, we not likely we're not likely to address all the questions that come in, but uh, let me just go back to some of the top that I had here. Uh, in the beginning, so we are which they said which MPAs are considered the gold standards uh, for marine. Let me just quickly click out of the window here so I can see it. Which MPAs are considered the gold standard for marine mammals? Yes, that's that's a really good question. I think John Delaney asked that, and it's um, I get asked it a lot. Um, you know, the first thing I always say to that is that marine protected areas are a work in progress, and they're a recent work in progress. I mean, it's uh, compared to 
areas on land, you know, they're, they are fairly young. Um, you know, one of the oldest areas, of course, is the Great Barrier Reef and um, Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, and one of the largest still. Uh, and the, it's, it really, um, you know, went step by step and had a lot of money invested in it in terms of the management plan. And, uh, and then, you know, initially didn't consider uh, uh, whales and dolphins at all, but then put together a plan for that. And a lot of different uh, zoning, you know, all these different kinds of zones for different purposes and overlays of other conservation tools, uh, which have made it a really interesting area. So it's, uh, you know, the, the, there's, there's certainly not, none that are perfect, but that's one that you really want to look at and look at what they've learned and, you know, what the mistakes were and also what they've been able to do positively. Uh, I'd like to point out the Papahano Mukuakea Marine National Monument, the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, which is one of my favorite places to think about. You know, this is, as I mentioned in my talk, this was an area that, uh, that uh, people convinced uh, Bush to start to protect and Obama put the finishing touches on it so that it really went all the way to the, um, uh, to the exclusive edge of the exclusive economic zone. And it's meant to be a, a category one, highly protected area. I think there were three fishing uh, boats that were, or, or in the, you know, uh, small fishing. Uh, artisanal, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that was going to be bought out. There is still, still, I think, some artisanal. But essentially, it is a protected area for all these species, including spinner dolphins and humpback whales and and all kinds of stuff we don't even know because it's an area that's actually larger than the Great Barrier Reef Mar Marine National Park. So it's one of the yeah. top 10. And that's, that's a great area. So, you know, um, it still needs attention. I think the biggest problem with all these areas is uh, money and investment and, and creating, you know, putting the money in to make uh, – an actual uh, man a good management plan and then putting a management body to work on it and and getting people behind it you know i that's why the i gave that stakeholder example for el vizcaino uh, biosphere reserve in mexico for the gray whale because they had such a fabulous um, example of local people really fighting for a protected area and helping to make it protected uh, so those are the those are three that I would give an example of, but it's a young it's a young thing, it's okay. it's still yeah yeah still in process. Uh, let me see another question. I'm just going to scroll down here. Uh, given the recent plan announced by President Biden on the protection of 30 percent of U.S. ocean by 2030, which areas do you think should receive strong protections in within the U.S. Uh, EEZ? There? Well, that's, yeah, that's a good question because the U.S. has um, made some massive areas in the islands in the Pacific, you know, n not just Papahanaumokuakea, but also um, around uh, some of the other Mariana Trench and, uh, you know, some of the other islands. And of course, the, they're the big national marine sanctuaries off California and off the East Coast. But I think really, um, I think Alaska could use a lot more, you know, yeah. there's not much in Alaska mm -hmm. in terms of protection. I think um, off the East Coast comes to mind, uh, Southeast Shoals of the Grand Bank, which is partly in Canadian waters, yeah. I think mostly in US waters and partly on the high seas. That would be a fabulous area to, you know, it has, I don't know, 10, 15 species of cetaceans and a lot of, um, uh, biodiversity, uh, and it's been recommended before, uh, but it hasn't received any protection uh, up to now. The other other thing that could be done is to consider some of the areas that are in place already, like the California sanctuaries, but extend them further out, you know, uh, and and try to uh, capture more of the protection, recognizing that blue whales and some of the other species that we see off California and yeah. And, uh, you know, that are that they're out there as well and could use a little bit more space. Um, well, they have the space, but right. you, know, you could you could impose a bit more protection and include some of that 30 percent. But I, I really think we have to think about how, you know, what does that 30 percent mean? 
you know, I mean, it's, it's a number and it's a nice fat number, but we really have to make it count uh, and have make real protection. And we have to put a lot of money behind all this if we're going to make it happen. Well, that gets to a question too, sort of, and that probably speaks to the political willingness and how strong is the international cooperation for creations of MPAs and how difficult is it to navigate many governments and regulations and uh, the daunting. And I, it's incredible what you got, what all of you have done here, but it's just. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, trying to get it integrated, it's a torture, really. <laughs> and and, and, and yeah. a lot of countries don't have the legislation to do I, it or to do it at a, at a very high standard. I mean, I think I mentioned when, when I first moved to the UK, there were 76 pieces of legislation that had to do, that you had to go through to think about getting an MPA. And it took about 10 years to get the kind of legislation where you could make MPAs and make them of a size that could then be effective. So you have to look at, um, you know, if you're, the ocean is a big, you know, a big place, it, you know, it, the areas for marine mammals, as we know, cross all these boundaries. So we have to think about multiple governments and that is going to be a huge challenge. And then we have to think about the high seas, which is most of the ocean. Yeah. And of course, we're waiting for the um, United Nations biodiversity beyond uh, national jurisdiction, uh, the, the um, legally binding rule that they are supposed to come up with which will allow us to make mpas um, on, on the ocean on the uh, high seas there are a few yeah. of them already that have been done by groups of countries like in the uh, osper agreement in the northeast atlantic yeah but uh, there's still you know we have less than one percent we have about one percent of the high seas protected and that's most of the ocean so it's nothing yeah yeah there's some interesting question of course uh, at we all know and, and on 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 land of course we can easily defend uh, define sanctuaries national parks uh, that's harder to do of course on uh, you can't put a fence on uh, on a on a marine sanctuary but how do you define it how can someone know that's the question here of course how do we know um and that yeah. makes it, of course, more much more difficult too. You don't know when you actually enter a marine sanctuary at what point. So, um, you know, we need to have those on charts. I mean, I yeah. think certainly um, Great Barrier Reef is well mapped, and people know where that is and where it begins and ends. Um, but you know, it's it, you know the, we need to have that. You know, because there, we do have the technology to be able to see those areas. Mm -hmm. um, you know on on our, uh, uh, you know, through shipping and through uh, uh, aerial work, everything. Indeed. So it's it's even even though they're not uh, stakes in the ground, you know, <laughs> no, no, those are very uh, significant boundaries. Yeah. Unfortunately, with a lot of the marine protected areas, the boundaries are very artificial. So they were yeah. created. You know, they may have st started out as a whale mm -hmm. habitat, but then, as I as I was saying earlier. You know, they really got, um, uh, you know, they get crunched down and, and um, straight lines get drawn and they have nothing to do with the oceanography and, and where the, you know, where the habitats actually are. So that's partly why we're doing this important marine mammal area process mm -hmm. to try and impose more science on all of that and to try and see what else needs to be done. Um. This, yeah, well, these, uh, let's see, da, 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 let me look at the other question that I had here. Um, will these areas be reformed as needed based on climate change? And that's sort of interesting, sort of taking climate change into, into, into account. Of course, the, the, the areas are changing so much. Of course, how do, is that something you have looked into? And, uh, some, and I'll have to apologize that some of the questions may have been addressed in some fashion during your, your presentation, but... No, that no, that's that's fine. I mean, I think the, uh, you know, that's on everybody's mind. You know, how much is climate change going to affect the movement of marine mammals? And you know, the fact that you know the premise of my talk was a sense of place that they come back to these places. Well, that that may be blown out of the water if the if the food yeah. is really going to move yeah. permanently. There are people thinking about um, dynamic marine protected areas. 
um, I think the idea of protecting really large areas and then having zones within it that might move uh, with the with the whales whale habitats. I mean, certainly in an area like Papahanaumokuakea, you could do that kind of thing. Uh, the smaller ones, of course, there's not much space. Part of those, some of those um, problems can be solved by uh, networks, by having um, you know multiple um, uh, marine protected areas that uh, protect different parts of the habitat. You know, um, but I think we're we're going to have to have uh, much more creative thinking about you know, how we protect them. Maybe the, the protection moves with them. You know, in a sense, that's what some of the laws do. Um, but you know, w whether you uh, uh, make the habitat around that movable area then mm -hmm. protected and and create a mechanism for that, that that could be uh, quite interesting as well. But yeah, I could is. see that. Uh, I could see that being evaluated, reevaluated over time in a period as just to to see what are the needs have shifted now to different areas or regions. Yeah. Yes, and and marine protected area. I mean, the National Marine Sanctuary Program. All of those. Uh, sanctuaries um, have reviews of their management plans and, you know, and they have a chance to reevaluate uh, what's needed. Yeah. Um, so that, yeah, that's going to be part of the process. We're about 10 minutes out of public. I see a couple of, maybe a couple more questions in there. Let me see what I have here. What can we do to increase MPAs, especially at the high seas where we work uh, in marine science areas or not? What are some of the steps needed? Um, so I work with youth and ask them how much the world's ocean are protected and they guess 40 to 7% and then they're alarmed to find out there's, right. So that basically speaks into how, how much of the ocean is really protected and to what, and of course you have addressed that already in your talk that is there is we really trying to focus on the areas. Of course, the, the needs are much larger than that. Is it something you can speak to or? Well, it's, yeah. It, I mean, right now it's less than 8%. So we're, we're trying to, uh, so expand that to as high as 30 percent um but you know it, yeah it's going to be um it's there are going to be a lot of trade-offs and there's going to be a lot of um of um of discussion with all the other stakeholders because people have different ideas of what the ocean should be used for and i think uh, marine spatial planning is going to come into this in a big way um Mm -hmm. Most countries, well, I think more than 90 countries in, around the world have signed up to marine spatial planning. And, um, you know, there's also talk of marine spatial planning on the high seas. And that would be a matter of, of trying to put the stakeholders together and think about, well, what are the areas that are really important for whales, for tourism, for, uh, for shipping lanes, for all of these different uses that are envisioned for a particular area and what are the trade-offs against losing biodiversity because of, you yeah. know, industrial work is, is that going to be worth, you know, uh, what are the arguments for that and against that? So it's, it's going to be a, uh, a big, a big issue, you know, a big discussion everywhere and between yeah. countries as we, as the, as the uh, world continues to shrink and the uh, climate emergency and bio and the extinction crisis, you know, are just hanging over us. So indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Just one sort of a last question to see if we can squeeze that in, but it's something obviously speaks to, there's still a very few na nations that do whaling and to what degree we'll have to, and I'm paraphrasing all of this anyway, but I think it's just basically just taking that into account, some of the whaling nations and, I think there's obviously less in probably Iceland, Norway, and, and Japan, of course. But um, is that something that's been taken into consideration? Are you are you dealing with any of these whaling nations still? Mm -hmm. Well, it's yeah, no. I think I think Iceland is um, on you know finishing with with whaling. It really looks very um, yeah. Uh, it looks like it's come to that finally, you know, and it's fantastic. And I know, you know, Iceland never had a kind of, of um, I don't think it was, well, it's, it's not the same kind of, um, of uh, you know, deeply ingrained whaling tradition that, that you saw, of course, in Norway and, and uh, Japan. 
Um, so I, I think they, they are starting to talk about marine protected areas. And we've had several meetings up there about certain areas. And that's quite exciting. Japan uh, really um, has a different way of looking at the ocean. And, you know, that's a, a way of putting it, I guess. <laughs> um, they're not thinking about marine protected areas in, in the sense that almost the rest of the world is. So yeah. I think that's, that's going to need some... Uh, some leaps, you know, I mean, on the other hand, they hosted the Convention on Biological Diversity uh, Convention a few years ago that, uh, you know, led to the Aichi targets, including 10% of the ocean to be protected. Yeah. So, I, you know, at the time we thought, well, this is great. You know, this is the next step. Japan's going to be very interested in, you know, making some yeah. significant protected areas. Uh, but no, it has it has not happened, and it w you know it will still take some time. Of course, whaling now is in J in Japan is restri restricted to Japanese waters largely, and they've got they've moved out of the Southern Ocean, the Southern Ocean Sanctuary, um, so they're not going into the Antarctic yeah. anymore. Yeah. Um, Norway is another story. I mean, they, Norway is making marine protected areas, but not um, not focusing on. Uh, well, habitats. Okay, good. Um, I'm wrapping things up here. I thank you so much, uh, Eric. This is wonderful. So I think you appreciate it. This is it's so it's so extremely important to have the this talk, which is wonderful and, and is excellent.